This is Julie Pearson, Little Thunder. Today is Wednesday, January 27th, 2014, and I'm interviewing Holly Wilson for the Oklahoma Native Artist Interview Collection. This collection is sponsored by the Oklahoma Oral History Research Project at Oklahoma State University. Holly, you're Delaware and Cherokee, known for your small-scale bronze and mixed-media sculptures, figures that you often capture in sort of dance-like movements to express shades of emotion. You show in multiple galleries, many of which don't particularly have a native focus, and I look forward to learning more about your work today. Thank you. Where were you born and where did you grow up? I was born in Lawton, Oklahoma, and I grew up um, initially in Lawton, and then we moved to Cherokee, North Carolina. My dad taught at the Indian Boarding School in Lawton and then got tra transferred to the Cherokee Indian Boarding School, and so we lived up there for a couple of years. And then we moved back to Lawton, and he finished there until they, when they closed the school, and then he started working with the military. And we did summers in Colorado while he was getting his master's. Oh, wonderful places to be. <laughs> um, so you mentioned what your father did for a living. How about your mom? Um, initially, my mom was just a housewife, and then when we got into junior high, she started selling real estate. And she did that until she just went back to, you know, being mom. <laughs> and uh, she was always always did crafts and art type things, and they built on the house incessantly. <laughs> is the best way to put it. <laughs> Brothers or sisters? Um, I am one of five, so I have an older sister, Alicia Wilson, uh, or Alicia Sams, and then there's me, and then I have my brother Robert Wilson, and then there's April Wilson, and then there's now Nicole Munoz. So all five. What was your relationship with your grandparents on either side? Um, my dad's parents passed away before I was born. And then my mother's side, I only knew my grandmother. We didn't know who the grandfather was. And um, she was uh, told history, interesting lady, a little dark. <laughs> That's the best way to put it. <laughs> so... So, in terms of the Delaware and Cherokee, are they on different sides of the family? No, it's all through my mom's. My dad's mom's. side is, they think, is Chickasaw, but it is untraceable. With the He was born in Idabel, Oklahoma, and they burned all kinds of records that would prove any Native American heritage. And so, with his, there's no tracing back through. And with my mom's, she's Delaware, Bob, and then Cherokee. Um, through the marriage side, or through the, through the matriarch side, so. Um, so you were back in Lawton at what age? Um, I started, when we moved back for the final time, um, I started kindergarten, so like, I think that's like six, roughly, these days, seven. It's, uh, they've got a lot of different intertribal influences there, were you sort of aware of those growing up? Our growing up was interesting in that because my dad was white and my mom was Indian, um, uh, I refer to it as having a fit in two worlds, but belonging really in neither. So because of the history that my mom grew up and just the Native experience she had, she worked very hard to shelter. So, and then um, we got all the awesome stories and the beadwork and the artistry, but they really kind of sheltered our... Um, like we went to powwows that had to do with the school, we went to donkey basketball, we went to, uh, my aunt likes to refer to it as you grew up white Indian, which I think is funny, but she had had such a hard time that they were very cautious as to what we were exposed to and how much, you know, you did outside of that, so. And then in Cherokee, my dad taught and he was the white teacher. And so we had friends, but most of our friends, it was very selective. We actually lived on top of the mountain at the high school. And so we were one of these houses. There was like six in the ring, and then it went to the ceremonial burial ground. So we were, we were separated from, you know, the regular reservation just because of our location. So it's kind of different. It's kind of odd. <laughs> what are your earliest memories of seeing Native art? Oh, um... It would have to be the beadwork my dad did, because even though my dad was white, he picked up beading in Cherokee, and it was one of the things 
that, and I don't know the legitimacy of it, but he brought beadwork to some people that had forgotten how to bead or they had lost the tradition. And he could sit down and count out, draw a picture of, you know, because he did a piece pipe and he did this beautiful drum thing, and he could count out, draw it out, and then that would be the last time he would look at it again, and then he would just do the beads by memory. And so that would be the first connection, is watching him bead. Because he was in charge of the science club and the art club and the dance club, and so he would take them uh, to dances, and the kids that didn't have dress, outfit, regalia, he actually made it for them. So, like, they couldn't afford bone plates, so they would do reeds um, and do those up and, you know, whatever it is they needed, he figured out how to make it so they'd have something to wear. So, that's... So, really, creativity on both sides. Yeah, <laughs> very much. Did you have any other extended family members who were artists? I don't think so. My dad was a painter, originally. I mean, he was, uh, he painted in Idabel, he had murals, and I remember there's some painter that came from Idabel, it was like he had more talent in his little finger than this man had, you know, and he's a, the guy's a reputable painter, but it was that whole age where it was, get a real job, support your family, so he stopped painting. In fact, I have one of his paintings in my house, and it's that, I, whenever I think of art, I think of my dad first, so. Did you meet any Native artists growing up? I don't remember any. Um, my mom and them talk about people that they knew um, and about artists they knew. So like I remember hearing Would You Would You Take Her and different names like that. But I don't know how much was story told or how much we ever met, which is kind of an odd. Because they, like at the boarding school in Lawton, there were so many people from different tribes, that I would hear stories because they'd sit around and play cards and all the stories intermingled. So like my cigar figures really are the stick people. That's an Osage story, it's not a Delaware story. So I have a hard time because it's all kind of a dream when you think of growing up there, so that makes any sense. What were your art experiences in primary school? None. We had no art in primary school that I remember. I remember theater and PE and making art at home. And my parents were always building on a house. So like I used a table saw in fourth grade. And I mean, I used, you know, if we were gonna paint a room, we'd knock a wall down. And I mean, very physical kind of art making. And a lot of stuff with sticks and creating shrines and odd things in the woods because we lived back to Creek and both lot. That's and, what you did to play. Yeah. So I played more making um, odd nature creatures is <laughs> the best way to put it. Um, but no art that I remember at all growing up in grade school. So, I mean, the turkey hands, I think, make the extent <laughs> of it. How about middle school or high school? Um, actually, I was going to add one thing. The one thing I do remember is my mom's stories of, I used to get up with my dad when he was taking architecture classes in Colorado, and I'd wake him up at five, and I'd have his pencils and coffee cup, and I'd sit and draw with him. And I have little drawings from just drawing with him, because he was studying architecture, so we'd draw in the mornings. And that was like the only thing I remember. And I always made storybooks and um, images like that. And I have those still, which is kind of amazing. But junior high and high school, uh, junior high, I took um, Mrs. Moody's art class in seventh grade, and I remember <laughs> she'd walk around and she'd rub her pencils through her rings, and you'd hear click, 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 and that's the only noise you were allowed to make, because it had to be very quiet to make art, <laughs> and you had to be very serious to make your art, so you'd hear click, 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 <laughs> and it was all perspective. <laughs> And that was seventh grade, and then so eighth grade, I wasn't going anywhere near it. And then in ninth grade, um, I had gotten hurt, so I got to take, I took art. I was doing gymnastics, but I got hurt, so I took ninth grade art, and it was Mrs., um, oh my gosh, Mrs. Pitchford? No, um, I can't think of her name. Oh, she was such a dear. Um, and uh, Mrs. Carter. And hers was the opposite. She was in the attic, kind of like the stepchild art teacher. And it was loud music and let's express ourselves. And it was like, I love art. So 
<laughs> and we learned, that was the first time I learned printmaking, and I actually sold a print from that year. The first thing I ever sold in my life was in a print I did, and it's a circle, and it has a bird, my birds, um, breaking out of the circle with these strange things. But that was where it was like, I like this. <laughs> <laughs> but it was like real different perspectives <laughs> on what is the appropriate way to create art. So they had a little art sale at the... They had um, where you could uh, submit, uh, you know, like competitions. And so I got into some competition she submitted at uh, the state or the art. It was at the building, the education building. And my piece was there, and somebody asked to buy it, and so I sold my first piece for like $25. So that's not bad for a ninth Very grade. Very excited. You know, so I was pretty excited. <laughs> in high school, after that, I took art like um, at least one, if not two or three times. And by the time I got in there, I took Mrs. Brown, and she was like a nice blend between the two. <laughs> and so I did... Um, uh, sculpture and I plaster and no clay. Well, no, I guess we did do clay and um, printmaking and batiking and it was all and then photography and when I got to do photography that was it. I was entranced and then I went to Quartz Mountain my senior year. At the end of my senior year I got in for drawing and photography and it was a real tough choice because the painting, the instructor for photography, uh, for painting was um, DJ, not DJ LaFont, um, he died, big Oklahoma native artist, um, uh, not R.C. Gorman, and not younger than R.C. Gorman, <laughs> but I can't think of his name. Ah, oh, this is terrible. Um, beautiful stuff, though. I can't think of his name. His art's all over Oklahoma, though. Um, and then there was the photographer person who had no idea, but photography was real, like, you could go out into the mountains and take pictures and go to villages, and so I chose that instead. <laughs> And it was wonderful. <laughs> what a great experience. Thank you. So how did you end up at the Kansas City Art Institute? It's my favorite story. And I always get told, why do you tell this story? So I got a scholarship to go to Cameron, actually, uh, universities. And so I went there, and I failed all my classes. <laughs> art, every class of art I failed. I had Benson Warren and Catalionis. And I just was not, it was not what I thought art school was going to be like, studying art, and I was not committed. And so instead I, qu I withdrew, up. at first I failed all those classes, and then um, I did an in-summer uh, or Christmas speech class, and then in the spring I tried theater or something, and I got smart and I figured out how to withdraw. And so then I went back to Quartz Mountain. And I said, you know, I want to do art, but this isn't working. And what do you recommend? So David Bluest, who I can't even tell you how awesome this guy is. He's out of Tulsa, and he was the darkroom tech. And um, while I was there, my camp counselor was Shanna Parkey and Bobby Harrison, who now are uh, uh, Parkey Harrison, really very well-known photographers, amazing stuff. And they said, you should go to Kansas City. And she was a recruiter for Kansas City, and he was a student there. So I said, okay, what do I need to do? And they told me how to apply, so I applied. Um, and I actually got in like a month before school, which is funny because I had no money. So, <laughs> But earlier that spring, I originally was going to apply to the Chicago Art Institute, and I went to some people that were um, professors, I won't say who, and I said, I want to go to the Chicago Art Institute. Would you give me a letter of recommendation? And they says, well, we'll give you a recommendation, but you're not good enough to get in. So um, I just let it go, and, and that was in the spring semester. So, and then finally by summer, I was withering and dying <laughs> inside, and that's when I met Bobby, and they were like, oh, yeah, it'll be great. So I went, my pond, my camera, my lenses, every piece of jewelry I had to get 100 bucks, and my sister and I drove from Oklahoma to Kansas City, and I worked as a waitress, so I got a cheap hotel because it was through the Holiday Inn that I waited tables. And so we got a $25 a night hotel, and we did the interview, and they're taking us to a nice meal. I'm like, so when do you find out if you get in? And she goes, you got in. I'm sorry. Yes, you're in, you're in, you're in. So then I had to figure out how to get $12,000 um, in a month. And so we did uh, Parent PLUS loans, um, student loans, and then I got uh, some scholarship money from the BIA, Bureau of Indian Affairs. So it was a lot of shuffling, and then that's how Kansas City happened. That's a great story. <laughs> Thanks.
Now, um, I read that you had a ceramics focus there, but it sounds like you were sort of on a photography track. Well, I went, I got in on photo, and I did their freshman year, which is legendary in freshman years. Um, it's a school that the first year, the first semester is like you try drawing and it's all, it's, we called it art boot camp because the whole idea is kind of to wash you out. Those who didn't, weren't committed, pretty much withdrew or quit within the first semester. And then the second semester you got to try things. And so there was a performance thing, there was photo book, and then um, I got to expand a chair to like three times its size, which was awesome. And I originally was going for photo, but in that environment I realized that they were going to strip photography down and make me learn photography. And for me, photography has always been I'm capturing fleeting moments that aren't planned, and that's how I photograph. And I thought, I can always take pictures, but if they strip my soul away, then I'll never have it. So I said, I'm going to keep this here. And instead, I got very interested in sculpture, so I enrolled actually in the sculpture department. But then it was very, we will move this big board over here. And if you didn't walk around and go, arr, 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 you just weren't really recognized. And I thought, I don't have to make sculpture and have this. And so a friend of mine, my roommate, was doing ceramics. And I loved, they did the figure, they were making pots, they were making sculptures. So I was like, I'm going to go do that. And I, I'd made one clay pot in my whole life, which is really funny. And I fell in love with it. And so the first time I was there, I had to make a whole bunch of pots. And I was like, I'm time to make pots. And then we got to make figures. And that was where my true romance began, is with the figure. And so I have a 10-foot sculpture, I think, behind the Delaware Tribal Complex, sleeping somewhere, mother, or uh, it was my picture of myself. And then, um, like right now, at the back of my parents' yard um, is an 8-foot sculpture I made in graduate school. but. I finished my degree in ceramics there, and when I went to graduate school, I realized I wanted to learn how to make things um, be more delicate on a single toe, and the problem with clay is you're fighting the weight of it and the fragility of it and all of these things, and that's when I took a jewelry class and fell mad, I'm probably jumping your subjects there, but I fell madly in love with um, metalworking. And I made these tiny figures that are only about this big in jewelry. And then, uh, so my MA was ceramics. I finished making large clay figures and plaster. And then when I did my MFA, because I separated them so I'd have more time to experiment, um, I switched to sculpture and then I learned the foundry. And so that's where I left photography altogether, <laughs> clay, and then to bronze. And the funny thing is, photography is always there. But photography has always been, like, my first time showing photography was actually at the Heard Museum that I showed prints. And I've gotten in... This last year. This last year, yeah. And um, I sold one of the pieces for the first time, and I've been doing photography since high school, which is funny. But um, I, uh, it's always the backstory. So a lot of my pieces begin in photo, and then they come to life in, in metal or in caustic. So it's always typically how I capture a piece because you get that fleeting moment that, you know, you get in photography and then you can have that to look at and build on. So, so did you go immediately on from undergrad to graduate work? Did you work in between? No, I applied to about six grad schools and got turned down by every one of them first. <laughs> That's kind of like the way my world goes. <laughs> Um, and then it turns out later that I got a less than admirable letter of recommendation from my professor <laughs> because I wasn't a real, I've never been a, here's what you should do, yes sir, yes ma'am. I'm like, but why? And why get you in trouble? Um, but my mom and dad are always like, why, why, why? So um, I took a year between undergraduate and graduate and I went home to Lawton and I got my real estate license and I sold real estate with my mom while I went through Cameron again this time to get my teaching certification the old backup plan so I got certified K through 12 and I went through all summer to the next summer and finished that and then I sold real estate at the same time which was kind of funny um, and 
while I was there, I met a woman who was dating a professor from Stephen F. Austin State University. And they were like, oh, you should chat with them. And they all knew each other. She was doing a show. And so I says, well, I did Clay and it was pure offense And she's like, oh, he went to Yale and he went to Harvard. No, Yale, no. Yale and then Alfred. So big Clay, God places. So I was like, oh, that sounds great. So I got an interview, got in down there. Um, that's when I found out about the bad letter. Um, <laughs> Because they were all like, you're a troublemaker. I'm like, no, I'm not a troublemaker. I just don't swim with the fishes um, all the time. So, uh, and that's where I started. And I did my MA first for one year. Got my MA in one year. And then you had six years to do your MFA. And I did my MFA. I was there for a year and a half. But I took the full six years to work on my MFA. Um, partially financially, but... You know, I was showing at the same time, too, so. So you were selling a little bit, earning a little bit. Yeah. When I went to, when I was in Kansas City, they always had a show at the end of each semester. And so I started selling art in ceramics right off. And so I would sell most of my pieces to collectors in Kansas City. And then, um, and my big coup de grace in Kansas City is I sold to Lenny Berkowitz at the Garth Clark, which I thought was really funny. Um, the little figures that irritated my professor um, to no end. And then he was like, oh, I always love those. And I'm like, yeah, sure, whatever. So <laughs> it's just one of those funny. I love the story. Some people are like, are you better? I'm like, no, they're funny because they're, they're life. That's how it happens sometimes. Um, and then when I got to MA, I went down and I decided I want a real gallery. And so when I was in Kansas City, I had gone to um, uh, Leedy Volkus, um, not Leedy Volkus, um, Jim Leedy, um, the, I, I think it was still the Leedy Volkus Gallery, but it was when Jim Leedy and Sherry Leedy were still married, and they had a huge, massive space, and it was awesome because they had contemporary stuff going, but they also had student spaces where... And so I said, Jim, if I clean this up and I paint it and I sheetrock it, can I show some art here? And he said, yes. So that was my first on my own solo show in a real gallery. And then when I went to graduate school, I said, I'm going to go get a gallery. So I went down to Houston because my graduate is in Stephen F. Austin State University in Nacogdoches, Texas. And I knew I was going there because I couldn't spell Nacogdoches. Um, it's a tongue twister too. So I go to Houston with a friend of mine during my MA and I had my little sheet of slides, you know, on the day of slides and my little resume and I just started on cold quit. Knock, knock, knock. Hello, my name is. All right. Thank you. Hello, my name is. Thank you. Hello, my name is. And then some people were nice and they were like, well, the work is interesting, but you need more shows and then more shows. And then I got to the last gallery and it was Goldsberry and they were like, oh, well, when you get the work, you know, let us know and bring some down. It's interesting, you know, and then they went on about their business and I was like, oh, that was exhausting. Let's go have pie. <laughs> so um, I went to an opening that night for somebody that we that taught at the school and I saw them again. And they said, well, where is this work? And I'd had my first show with Leslie Powell and Lawton at the Leslie Powell Gallery. And it was actually a native show. And it was my MA body. And they said, well, when you get that back, let us know. We'd like to see it. And so when I got the show, they actually came to Nacogdoches. So they drove two hours up from Houston. And they took most of the work back. And I had a show right off. So And I sold really well. And I was with them pretty much all the way through... Um, until they closed their gallery. So I started, was that like 98, 90, no, it was further back because that was when I moved to Houston. So uh, it was early 90s, some time in there. And there was a little break where I stopped showing between in like 2000 to 2007. And then I started with them again in 2009. So, But that was my first like, dun, 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 you were a gallery. Yeah, that's <laughs> great. And that worked really to help sustain you yeah that relationship so so was that your first native show then that you had done in Lawton. that you were doing in Lawton yeah how did, um, how did that come about Leslie Powell gosh I don't even remember she contacted me and she was having a show and I can't remember it was like native ties something to do with you know native artists and it was me and I remember Gerald Kanoye because I was in graduate school and a couple other artists were chosen to be in the show together. So, and it was when she was still above the little chapels. So you had to carry your art up those steep stairs. Um, but she has been a champion and such an awesome believer in my work from the very beginning. And then I had a show at um, the military base 
uh, Fort Sill at their mm. Arts and Crafts Center. I had a show there too, but not none of them were representation. That was the first time I'd ever had a show like in a gallery represented re represented by. Right. How did you know how to price your work? Um, Kansas City was real specific. I have to say, Ken Ferguson and Victor Babu and George Timmick were very about the business of art, which I feel so many people didn't get the business. So to even graduate, you had to have a, slide, a sheet of slides, you had to have an artist statement, you had to have a bio, and you had to have a resume. And with a sheet of slides, you had to have the name of the piece, the material, the size, the medium, and the price. And so they really talked to you about pricing and what work is worth. And we went and we saw galleries. Um, uh, we went to like June Canicos. And then when I was in my senior year, me and a friend flew to California for the Advancement of Ceramic Sculpture uh, Conference. It was like in its second or third year. And that was at UC Davis. And the neat thing about that is it was before it had transferred. So when we first went, we heard Viola Fry speak and Stephen Stabler and like all these amazing artists. And it was seeing their work and then seeing the pricing in the galleries and then comparing the age of how old you you were as an artist and the material and then valuing it that way. And then when I first started selling with them, we talked about pricing. So it, there was the assistance of the gallery as well. but. I was, like I said, with Ken and them, we were talking pricing like, right off in the gallery. So you really got a good business yes. base there. Yeah. When did you move into Lost Wax Casting? Was it in graduate school? Yeah, so graduate school, I took jewelry casting. Instead of taking like how to cut it and solder it, that was the boring stuff. I was like, I don't want to do that. I want to do the casting part. So my uh, Lost Wax Casting began in jewelry. and. So then I went upstairs to my MFA and did it in the ceramic shell. But what I do now is actually reverted back to the jewelry method where I use investment casting. So it's still lost wax, but it's using jewelry casting investment instead of the ceramic shell. What do you think your attraction, you sort of explained that there was a, this very macho sort of attitude on the part of the the big sculpture people. <laughs> but what else um, do you think draws you to working on a small scale? Uh, um, well, I love, you know, it's weird you say that because it's like my work is starting to get multiples. So, but, but I love about the smallness began originally from, <laughs> um, it's the size that fit in the kiln, the first kiln I had. So a friend of mine gifted me this tiny uh, beehive kiln, which I still have. And the kiln itself was only about that big. And so the inside only fit a coffee can. So my first pieces I was making were only the size of a coffee can. But even before that, I was making smaller pieces. And what I liked, they were a little bit bigger though, but what I liked about them is the intimate quality of them. So you, you had to get up and interact with them. And there was such an intimate conversation that you had with the work. And at the same time, um, Sometimes scale can be deceiving. Uh, if you make it, like I, and it's really weird, I have this thing, I love big art and I love little art. Three quarter size art, I'm good with life size, but three quarter size art is just, oh, there's something wrong with that. <laughs> it's like I need it either for me to be either life really small or really big. And so it's just always kind of stuck with me. Um, and what I've started doing is making multiples so that like on a wall you'll have two figures or three or four figures and so they're still small um, or like I have one that's in progress that'll come out next year that's actually 22 foot long but the figures are only this big so it's the same kind of idea of that intimate quality and it's something I can do myself I don't have to founder it out so and also each of your pieces is one of a kind yes huge thing. In clay, you know, you made a piece and that was it. And each piece has its own life. And this is the part that, you know, I always, like you have to judge your audience because some people are like, what? But I feel like each thing I make has its own spirit and I give it a life and I, it has its own story. And so I don't make additions. In fact, I don't even have molds. So I make my wax, my bronze wax, just like I do my clay. So I build it directly in wax, and then I sprue that and cast it. And if I lose it, it's gone. I don't go back and remake it. 
and I don't make more. I have molds that I've made from the pieces. So I have like these rough face molds and I have rough hand molds, but everything gets um, refined. And so I have the faces because I realized they wanted to start doing a series with a certain look or sisters or twins. That's a big thing I've started on. So I have that, but none of them are identical and none of the stories are ever identical. You've noted that your sculpture sort of talks about the fragile nature of life and the human body. Um, and I wondered if you could expand on that a little. Well, when I, so I have two phases of work. I have pre-kids and post-kids. <laughs> so pre-kids was all about actually dealing with um, um, my heritage in a very direct way with elders. And so, and very much these kind of spirit figures. Um, and then um, I, 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 I got married and moved to Chicago and I started working design and this whole other and my work stopped production and I just started working, trying to work out like who I am, where I am, that kind of, what's it, graduate school's over, what am I going to do now? Um, and then I had my son and it was really interesting because right before my son my work started to shift and then I had my son and it changed like everything in my work because my mom had always told me stories about, you know, you don't leave your toys out at night because the spirits and, you know, what you did or didn't do culturally when you had children. And, you know, listening to her is like, almost like the wind. It's like, that's interesting. Ah, but it didn't make any sense. And then you have kids, and I had my son, and I was sure I'm just like a nervous Nelly and a helicopter mom, but it really changed how I saw the world because I felt like I became not just the guardian of him, but like the guide, like what I did or how I chose and the fragility of that relationship and then the fragility of his own life. And then it made me, and I get all verklempt, <laughs> it made me realize that that's there all the time. But it's just the blinders because I was a single person. I never saw outside of myself. And so now I hear my mom's words and they make sense, you know. And some of the things may be told as things that truly happened and why you watch for things, or they're just that cautionary tale to help guide you. So that's where the work, so it has to do with my culture and stories that were told, but it also has to do with how I raise my children and how I watch for them and how I see the world through their eyes sometimes. So that kind of thing. It seems like a lot of your figures are women, and I might be <laughs> not seeing the whole range. But. No, most of them are women. Most of them are actually little girls. Um, and that, even with my son, when I had him, I was still making little girls. The only little boys I have in the work um, started from a geode piece. And um, the little girls kind of are my story of myself as well as the story of my daughter and the story of woman and the story of female which I don't seem like it's I was telling somebody something I was working on they're like you just don't really seem like an activist and I'm like I think activists come in many shapes and sizes and different voices and so for me it's about growing up my mom um, grew up on the boarding school and her mother was a cook and they lived above the kitchen. And so for my mom and dad, and for my mom in particular, it was very much what you can do. You can do anything you put your mind to. And so it was a really interesting thing watching. And I tell people now, I says, you know, I feel so bad because as a parent, you want your kids to succeed, you know? And it's hard to see the lessons not always lived up to or passed, but then even thinking, they said we could do anything we want, we could do it all. And that's really not the truth because in doing everything, something suffers. So, and it may not be suffering to the point that they, they wither and die, but there's always this give and take of what you can and can't do. And I watch my mom try to accomplish all of that and then instill in me that belief I could. And I think the best gift was being able to step back and go, no, I have to succeed at what I love only. And they always said that. Whatever you do, follow what you love, and you'll figure out how to make a living or a life out of it. And so I wanted children, but I also wanted to be an artist, and I was doing design work, and somewhere we had that conversation where it was like, 
I can't do it all. Something has to stop, and that's why we moved back to Oklahoma. Is it was not that it was slower pace, but I, I could not. I was not going to make myself remove from the job that made the money willingly. And so it was a way for me to break that cycle and then say, here's what's important. And so the little girl is me and so many, and my mother, my mother's mother, and my daughter, and yeah. those things. So. Um, and I'm really struck by, um, it totally makes sense, um, your interest in, because they're seasoned, they're very seasoned faces and they're very seasoned bodies. They're not pretty mm -mm. and they're not uh, necessarily youthful. Do you see them as being of any particular ethnicity? You know, it's interesting. I don't. In fact, I don't even work from pictures of people. I have like, like when I'm talking to somebody and my husband gets mad at me sometimes, he says, turn off the x-rays. I, su I study faces. And so if there's something I just love about a face, an apocampic fold or a way a nose turns, they'll turn up in the work. And so they're really, and this got me in trouble in undergraduate. Uh, my work is very much a building of faces from an inventory of life. And so um, when I first started making figures, they were kind of a brown color, and then I started doing black patinas. And I've been asked, are they brown, are they native, are they African American? And I'm like, they're anything you want them to be because they are, they're not even real people. They don't have ears, which most people have never picked up on. They don't have ears and they don't have belly buttons and they don't have genitalia, which I find really amazing. And it's on purpose because if you have ears and genitalia and a belly button, you're a human, you're born into this world and ears let you hear. And um, the genitalia def defines you as male or female. And in my figures, especially the ones that don't have any clothes on, the only way I want you to know that it's male or female is in their body posturing. And that's the connection I want you to get, is I want you to feel that sense. And I got that from watching my son and my daughter, because their movement in the world is so different than from each other. So um, that's why they're not one thing or the other. So you do explore tribal motifs. Sometimes they're overt, um, but a lot of times it's just, uh, it seems like, belief systems or values that just kind of get threaded into the work? Yeah. Um, there are certain characters or um, specific stories like um, like my birds especially. All my birds are shapeshifters. And it's funny because people are like, oh, shapeshifters are bad. I'm like, no, they're not. I mean, my mom told me a story when I was growing up that her grandmother, so it would be my great-grandmother, um, was visited um, when they lived on the farm by a midwife. And she wanted her to come and train with her. And the father and the sons were like, no, no, no. She is staying here and she's cooking and taking care of us. That's her job. There was no wife or she died. And um, my great-grandmother wanted so desperately to go to school and to go learn this. And she would have traveled around and done all these things. And they were like, no, no, no. So the midwife leaves and she comes back and she goes, I've come again. You know, she needs to come and train and then... That way she can go and do. And they were like, no, no, no. And it was in the day where they had the fire in the front. And the man was like, get off my property. No, no, no. And she stepped into the fire and rolled into all these shapes and turned into all these animals. And then stood up and again said, I would like to take. And it was Grammy Num Num is her name, which is really funny. With me. Uh, and they were like, go, go, go. And then she turned into an owl and flew away. And so then she comes again. And... Um, they, she asked one more time, and they were like, no, you need to go away, and they actually shot at her when she flew away as an owl and wounded, the, wounded her. Well, in the months to come, um, each one of them befell a horrible event. You know, One of them ended up falling and shooting a part of himself, getting his gun trapped. Another one got a, a thing on his face. And then when she came back, they were like, yes, yes, please stop whatever and we'll let her go and they let her go and be trained as a midwife so then she was able to travel you know when someone needed to deliver a baby but it was just the the greed of the no you're going to stay here and you're not going to be educated and you're not going to be trained but the shapeshifter she was a quote rich or shapeshifter but it wasn't in a way that I ever interpreted that story to be a horrible thing and then also birds are the messengers from the spirits that come down so 
I see that they can be tricksters and I see how there can be bad things and I know that each culture has a different interpretation but I've always felt that it is what you make of it and what is it that the message is taking. So in my birds, if you look at them, they're encaustic birds and they're built in encaustic, all of it. And then anything that really comes off, I cut and cast. But the key is all of the eyes are humanized, so they're built with the epicanthic fold and the eyebrow ridge and the human pupil, and then all of them have human hands. So you have to get real close because at first they look like bird hands, but they're holding the branch and they're human's hands. And so for me it's that moment you know, like that you caught them shifting. You know, whether it's shifting to a bird or shifting as a man or a woman. And it's that moment. And some of them, I feel, are hung because it's both worlds are seductive. Which world do you live in? The You know, the world of man, the world of spirit. And I feel like shifters have this wonderful gift, but at the same time, they have to leave. And all stories you read of shifters, you know, the otter and all these different animal stories, they're saddened as much as they're happy to go to wherever it is they are because they've made loves and attachments and it's hard to make those shifts so that's my birds <laughs> or almost any animal i you know if you see an animal normally that animal is if it's not its spirit animal it's um it's the idea that they're a shifter with in the your work in my work yeah um we talked about santa fe indian market briefly um before we started the interview here, but tell us about, you did your first Santa Fe Indian Market last year. Yeah. What was um, that like? It, it was amazing. I mean, that's the first time I've ever seen all, uh, that many different Native people and their work together. And um, it's interesting because my, I was an undergraduate and my mother had asked me to show my work in Lawton at an Indian show that was happening at the Armory. And this is real, pivotal in that it was I was in it was an 88 and so she took my work and she put it on the table and it's my old spirit figures and whatnot and she remembers the guys going that's one bad ombre those are some crazy looking figures and they like the work and then as we walked around and looked it was all these beautiful pieces of art but the guy goes well let me show you what I really do and then they would pull the art out from underneath the table and they would show you what they really made and it saddened both my mom and I, and it made me think, I, I don't want to do that. And so the problem 20 years ago, 25 years ago, is if you said you were Native American and you made art, you were pigeonholed into this very second-class society of what people expected Native artists to make. And so I veered far away from anything that had to do um, with cultural markets because of that experience. So Santa Fe, I was real hesitant um, because my work has stories and my work has a feeling, but my work is not what people would think of as Native American art, you know, from just a, a magazine cover. And so a friend of mine, Shane Goshorn, um, in the Urban Indian Five, was like, she went the year before and she was like, you really need to do this. This is different than what she thought it was going to be. She had a wonderful experience. And so I applied and got in, and then I did win um, a ribbon for a sculpture second place, and it was awesome. I was very tired. But um, it was neat because I got to see things that I probably would never have seen in all of my life on my own. And so I applied for this year, and one of my goals when I go this year is to take the time to walk the fair, which last year, as much as I wanted to, I didn't take as much time to look at what was there. And what I did do, I went to the herd in March last year, and one of the things I did is I looked up all the artists I could find online. And so I didn't get to do that with Santa Fe just because of timing, and it was really nice. And the same thing is to try and walk the fair just to meet some of the different artists to see what is being made and, and what's out there. Very energizing. Yeah. Really um, how important are commissions to your work? <laughs> I laugh hysterically. I'm a terrible commission artist. Um, and the reason is commissions are awesome, and I'm supposed to be thrilled to get a commission. I should be so excited that people want to commission my work, but I have um, a strange relationship with commissions. Um, I am thrilled. I am honored. But they stop 
my production so fast and so hard because I start worrying about what people think of the work and what they're expecting. And um, I have a series called Paper Wings, and it's this idea of, again, a shifter where it's a person half bird and half man. Um, and the masks aren't, some people refer to them as um, the plague mask. I'm like, no, the plague mask covered your whole face. And mine are actual masks. Um, and you use them as personas. So anything that's got a mask is a persona. So if I need the ability to fly, you would wear the mask of the bird to be able to fly above a situation or to the strength of a bear so that you would have the strength to protect yourself. So um, I made one, the first one, and had the show, and of course it's old, and people are like, I want that. You know, I had two commissions. And I says, I will do a commission. And that's the first time I've ever had the commission. And I says, but the presumption of it is that they will never look the same. So they will have a mask, they will have wings, they will be on this thing, but the figure itself has to be distinctly different because I think each one has to have its own life. And that's the only way I've managed to do commissions. But I try and go, no, let's not do that. <laughs> no. <laughs> and I think if... Um, if it was something like taking a small piece and making it larger or doing, I think that they would be a lot more attractive to me. But I'd rather just have the freedom to create whatever is needed for my soul, I guess is the best way to put it. <laughs> I'm a very bad commission artist. <laughs> What's been one of the best or worst comments you've gotten in response to your work? Oh, wow. Um, the worst is when they look at it and they go, uh, that's interesting, or isn't that kind of funny, um, which I find odd, and I know that that shouldn't be bad, but it's in a snarky kind of way, and it's like, you didn't get it, but that's okay, because there's enough art for everybody, um, and I just kind of step back, because like you said, the figures, though they are modeled off of a child's frame, they're not children. They're idea, this, the idea that they're old spirits, and that's why the faces and the bodies are very different. Um, and I think the best compliment would be when somebody can actually tell the story or they feel the emotion of it. You know, I've had people actually tear up on a couple of the pieces because I've started. I never told the stories because every piece is built from a story. So no piece is ever made without a story happening first or it being in tandem with a story. And so, but I've always kept the stories to myself. And so now I've started kind of letting some of the stories out. And, you know, I think my favorite thing is when people read, see the piece and they go, I completely understand that emotion. Because my, I want, what I'm trying to do is just like in my photography, I want my sculptures to capture that moment of an emotion, that moment of um, an excitement, a sadness, you know, a choice, a, you know, I have a piece where the little girl's head is down and she's against the wall and her arms are kind of draped and it's on this beautiful half circle and it's called Should I Stay or Should I Go? And the piece was actually originally built when my mom was in a coma dying and I felt like her spirit was trapped. She could heal, but to heal she would be trapped in the shell and so it's your body's hanging. Do I stay? Do I go? But you don't want to put that on a wall in a gallery. But mm -hmm. it also lays into the idea of anything in life. You have a choice. You know, it's a bad situation. Do you stay? Do you go? Do you cut and run? What do you lose? What do you gain? You know, so though they're very personal to me, I think they have a very universal meaning for most people in society. So. Yeah, I've seen some wonderful nuanced emotions in your work just from the web. Um, let's talk a little bit more about your process and techniques. Um, you, do, you do mixed media sculptures that combine, you're sort of working with combinations of materials, I guess, even with your bronzes, sort of. Yeah, um, I am not a, I'm not a purist. <laughs> I only went to bronze and this probably makes most bronze people cringe uh, because of what its material can do. So I originally, all my sculptures were seated unless they were really large and I wanted the sculptures to stand and I, my biggest thing was on their tippy toe. I just wanted that tiny toe connecting them to whatever it is. And I use materials based on what the materials represent. So um, like paper wings originally was built from a table leg 
and there were these table legs at the Indian school. They cut them, my mom and dad got them when the school closed, and they cut the table legs down to make coffee tables, and they had all these little eight table legs, you know, little pieces, and, my, and they had the old brass caps, and you could see where they'd been worn, and the life had been in them, and they're gorgeous oak, and so she came, and she goes, I know you have some purpose for this, and so I said, I do, I don't know what, and I carried them around for years, and drives my husband crazy, because he has to move all my junk. Um, <laughs> And then I took this table leg, and I just really love the idea of the negative space of this leg. So it's here's this leg, this table. You, you know it's a table or a chair coming out of the nothingness, and here's this figure. So it's kind of like when you're certain times of the day or night, and you feel these things from the side of your eyes or this other sense. So it's that idea of here's this negativeness, and here's this thing that doesn't belong that's in this other place. And so that's where those things began. And um, I have a series of little girls with dresses. Um, and they're like two of them. One of them's on a branch reaching. And as she's hanging off the side of this branch looking around, there's a bird sitting on the edge of the bird, on the tr branch watching her. It's one of the birds, the human birds. And it's almost like it's looking and going, you got yourself into a mess, didn't you, little thing? And there's no conversation but the look on the bird's face, but the bird's made of sterling silver. And it's interesting because I call them birds of burden. So birds, anything that's precious, has a value attached to it. So, and the value is that you have to care for it. Because if you didn't care for it, it wouldn't be a burden to you and it wouldn't be precious. So things you love in life, though you love them, and this some people don't get this, like you still, like I have two gorgeous children who I love dearly, but I also have to know where their whoobies are and what is their favorite teddy bear and what is the song they have to sing and where is this shoe and where is this toy and you have to have your hand on so many things. And so they became birds of burden. And so um, that the silver birds are made of sterling silver because it's a precious metal. And I have another one that I love that I probably should have. And it's a little girl and it's called With Her Burdens specifically. And she has seven birds and they're tucked in her arms and they're rubbing her cheeks. And it's that idea that she's having to care for all these burdens, you know. Mm -hmm. And she loves them, but the, the, the day, they can drive you nuts. <laughs> <laughs> Do you, um, you mentioned you work often from photographs. So does that take the place of any sketching before you pick up? Anything no, tomorrow? it's, it's a, uh, they kind of go in tandem. So sometimes I'll just have an idea, a flash, I'll see something in, in, in life and I'll do these really cryptic sketches. Um, and cause I've never considered myself a very good drawer, like in art school, even in high school, I could make things, but like I just, my dad could draw and my sister could draw and their paintings. And I thought, Oh, I'll never do that. And, um, so I could, I can, which is really kind of funny, but I never considered it my forte. And then I use photos when I'm actually out somewhere and I just see that exact moment and I can just capture, capture, capture. And then I'll bring it home and then sometimes the two become, you know, one. So it really, there's no one or the other. And then sometimes I'll sit down and just innately start working and see what comes of that and just let the subconscious uh, take over in those moments. What about titles for your pieces? Are they... Oh, they're huge. Yeah, nothing is ever untitled. Um, the titles are the tiny tidbit to let you know, or the story. Um, I have a series of figures that are falling off the walls, and I love how, um, like, the swimmers would hang on the wall, and then they just, there's that moment where they release, and they're in, and that's where I first started doing the research, looking online for swimmers. But it was because I felt like um, in my life where I was at, I had to decide if I was in or out with what I was doing. And so I feel like there becomes that moment where you have to uh, release what you're doing and fall in. And so I think I lost the train of thought on that. I know it had to do with falling figures. What was the, um, the initial... Well, we were talking about title, but you're oh, so yeah. interested in those moments of... And so, Threshold. Threshold. So, one of the pieces was called Threshold. Sorry, I'm like, I knew I'd, there was some way to get back there. And then another one was called Blind Faith, because the titles represent that meaning of these figures and what they're doing. So, because some people go, oh, they're running up the wall, and it's like, if that's what you wanted to do, that's fine. But it's that idea where 
the title has to give you that. For me, it gives you the rest of that story. Visually, you see it and you get that. But it's like the should I stay or should I go, that sums it up. And that's, I love hearing that it shows. That totally makes sense. You know, I get that. So to me, the title and the piece is hand in hand. So, and sometimes I can't finish the piece until I know either A, the base, the material, or the title. Like they all have to come together in a, a moment to make them all work. In other words, you need to know what you're going to do for the base, you're saying? Yes. Like, I have, I had a piece um, that I refer to as Mother, and I worked on her for eight years, and she's at Bonner David right now, and it was really funny. I began her in Chicago, and it was just a simple study of a woman, and she was just beautiful. And I took her home, and I had these gorgeous little boat forms, and I sat her on there just to get her out of the way, and then I was trying to finish her, and I kept trying to figure out what to put her on, and I'd take her off the boat, and I'd move her around, and... I put her back on the boat and I realized that was her base, you know. But it's weird until I understand, like, the whole story of the piece. Mm -hmm. And I'll rush things sometimes because I'm like, ah, oh, oh. And I regret because um, it doesn't make sense. And it's really funny because they normally don't sell. And then I'll finish what they were doing and then the piece um, all comes together and makes sense, so. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about kinds of research that you do for your sculpture, and part of it, it sounds just like it involves being around your children. Yeah, and then part of it also is I've started for some of the work I'm doing now. Um, I have a piece I'm working called Bloodline, and so like my political activism is very quiet. But I'm working on a piece called Bloodline, and it's tracing my heritage all the way through my family. So before my mom died, actually it happened when my dad died, I realized that if my mom were to pass, she's the last one who has all our stories. She has the last one that has all our history. And you know, young people, you're busy living life and you don't slow down. And so we started going through all the records she had and who the people were. And, um, and it's really interesting because it's different history. It's like, um, this is the one that got chased out of Missouri because they were horse thieves, you know, this family or, you know. So the history is really, it's littered with these beautiful stories about the people as well. So the piece is uh, about 22 foot long. It's this locust tree that fell down by the kids' school, and I was just, oh, this wood is beautiful, because the heart of it has this beautiful pink flesh to it, and then it has this golden color. And so I, of course, lugged all these pieces of wood home. <laughs> my husband loves me. And for Mother's Day, I bought myself a, ch a chainsaw, um, <laughs> which I thought was perfect, because he got a grill. Um, so I cut the wood horizontally down the middle of the tree. So it actually will mount on the wall and you can see the life of the tree through the lines, but on a vertical going up. And so the whole tree, and it's an exhibit that happens in 2015 in Oklahoma Contemporary and I'm super excited. And all across the top, each section is cut and on top is these cigar figures. And the cigar figures are, again, my reinterpretation of an Osage story about the stick people. And the stick people would run along the side of your car, and, they, and this is how old the car story is, because they said, you're running boards. And they would call your name, or they'd be in the woods, and they'd call your name, and they'd summon you. And if you went, you would vanish, and you'd die. And so I always wondered what they looked like, but of course nobody's gonna tell you, because they would have been dead. But the idea of these stick figures, so in graduate school, um, I, I'll circle around, I promise. I started dating a guy who was smoking cigars, and he would put the cigars out, and I thought they were these gorgeous little dresses. They just looked feminine, which I thought was amusing that a man is smoking something that has a dress on the end. And then I started playing with sticks, and I thought, you know, if I were a stick person, I would have a cigar-shaped body, this tobacco, you know, this idea. And so I took the stick figures and I reinterpreted it to be cigar figures. So there's the tobacco for the cigar, you know, and going back to the idea of um, our culture and what tobacco represents for different people. And then the sticks from nature, actual cast sticks. And then the top of the heads are actually flat silhouettes. And so from one side, there's absolutely nothing. They're just the shadow of the figure. And then the other is this relief of the figure. And so on top of this 22 foot tree, each section is a generation. So the research I did with my mom helped me find like, okay, so originally it was just me and my siblings and now it's my children. 
and then it's me and my siblings, and then it's my mother, and then it's my father, and then it weaves between the two. And so that anybody that I have an image of, I'm working historically from the image for their, their detail, and then also their height and placement, and there are so these walking cigar figures across the top, and then the act of the way the light hits them, they cast a shadow on the wall, and so the shadow is the memory because memory is intangible, you know. A picture is not the memory, it's the emotion you carry. So the piece has the life of the tree, it has the life of my family, my blood, and then it has the memory of my people, casting shadow. And as they go farther back in time, and there's no imagery, they become less detailed, but they don't become less important. And then the other thing I found interesting is there was a reference to Children of the Mist. So children who died, and I know this is also in Scotland, and my heritage has um, got uh, Scottish, both Campbell and McEwen, mixed in with the Delaware and the Cherokee. And so I'm wondering how much of that is the crossover. And children of the mist are children who died at birth or right thereafter. And so all the way through this history my mom kept reading, and the writings that people wrote about their children, is even if the child died before birth, they referred to it as the boy you know, we lost a son. And mm -hmm. so the family still had five kids, even though only three lived. And so I found that very intriguing all the way through the history. So any of the pieces that the children didn't live, their head pieces dipped in wax, so it's all uh, like they're behind a mist or a shawl, and then their head is pointed down, but they're still counted. So they represent things that matter still. So that's kind of where I do the history. And then, you know, just reading the different stories. So what the, uh, the I love the stories that are um, like the written mythology stories. And so I have a series I'm starting um, that I put in for next year, got my fingers crossed, but it's also going to happen at the same show. And it's called Native American Superheroes. And so, because I feel like there's a stereotype of what Native Americans are. And um, I want to take stories like things like, uh, say, the Three Sisters, and tell a story about the Three Sisters in a contemporary setting and how we are today. So they become superheroes, so that's the awesome part. So there are going to be three women that are, you know, created to look like the beans, quass, and scorn, corn, if I can speak. But what they're fighting is sugar, because sugar is a killer for all society, but it was all about the mix of the three and how they grew and what their powers were to fight something like sugar. So then I'll make a sugar crystal monster that then, so here will be these superheroes. So that's how I work with mythology or I tell my story, is not through um, just telling old stories, but how do I take a story and then interpret it in a way that it has meaning and power for me. So that's my, my take. <laughs> Those sound like wonderful pieces. Um, so this exhibit, you mentioned the Oklahoma Art Museum? Uh, I was, Oklahoma is, Contemporary, which used to Oklahoma be Oklahoma Contemporary, yeah. which is in Oklahoma City. Yeah, it's a uh, fairgrounds, and it will be probably one of the last shows because they're building a new building. And I originally had presented this idea of this exhibit to Joy Reed Belt at JRB, and she was like, I think it's just too big for my space. And so um, she got me in touch with Julie McGuire, and I got to present my whole concept, which I'm excited because it's actually five components. And so, like, the sticks, the trees one, the superheroes one. Um, another one is um, um, falling figures. So it's a whole yeah. bunch of falling figures that so will end up taking a span of, like, 20 feet, you know, and but they're all still tiny figures. And it's under the influence of gravity, so it's really talking to the idea of people say, well, I didn't have any option, I was, I was drunk, or I was, it was culturally what I had to do. And it's that idea of making choices. And then um, there is my first step back into life-size clay figures. And so I'm really excited, and this is something that started with my mom and my dad just kind of reconnecting with them. Um, they gave me buckskin and porcupine quills, and I have a bear skin that my dad and him hunted, and it's funny because the dog got it, so instead of it being a big bear, it's a whole bunch of little bear pieces. So, but one of the things I'm doing is I'm making Native American masks, my interpretation of animal masks, that are personas. And so each of the seven figures representing the seven directions and at the same time the seven tribes of the Cherokee, will have a mask that represents a persona of strength. So there'll be like the porcupine, there's going to be 
the, a deer skin, there'll be a fox, there'll be a bear. And the bear, though the mask is a bear's face, it's, you're going to see the herringbone stitching. So you almost see the scars on the face and how it was healed, you know, and that idea of the fragility of even a bear, you know. And then through, the, the figures are all done in white porcelain and then they'll have glass eyes. And so it works, my mom always talked about um, animals and that idea of white is uh, the spirituality and the specialness and that spirit. And so for the exhibit, the children represent portals between the two worlds. And so when you look at the eyes, you see through the eyes, the window to the soul, and you see the portal between the two worlds. And so they're in real masks made from real materials, and then they're going to be positioned through the room. And then all around the room, you know, in October in Oklahoma, you get the birds and the grackles and the starlings. And when the birds, they're an invasive bird, and so they came from Europe, and they'll take over a nest, and they'll plant their eggs and kill the babies that are native. And so it's kind of that my political stance for how as much as I am happy for who I am it was a violent way that it came um, so then the birds are swarming in a tornado form around the seven figures and then the masks will come off um, and I'm photographing my children in them and that's another series and it's called Native in America so it's the misperception of what Native children have the ability to do. They go to the mall, they go to movies, they read books, they go to libraries, they're in public schools. You know, and so each one of them will wear a mask, they jump on trampolines, they swim in pools, and then I'll do large format photographs in heightened color of them in the masks interacting in daily life. So that's, and then the whole thing, the educational component I'm really excited is, uh, and it came from a, a birthday party I did for my son is, so then we're gonna have students come and we're going to tell them stories from his history and then ask them questions about it and then they have to come up with a story using something that has a spirit figure like what's an animal of power for you and what would you be if you could be something and then I want them to write a story in today's time so it makes sense to them in today and then we'll put them in a book and then we're going to f make the mask and then they'll be photographed and I always loved the old photographs where they're like on a burlap and so then they'll be their self before and their spirit self in the mask and we'll photograph them and then that'll be put in a book so they'll get to learn about the history create a history create a mask and then make a book and then take that story with them so that's the show <laughs> don't tell anybody <laughs> wow so it's a, a major undertaking is that one of the biggest that's, solo shows that yeah. then you would have that ever had ever had something. yeah so with the five components and my goal is to try and once I have more work done is to start soliciting to other to for museum show mm -hmm. because it has such I think a touch on here's today's contemporary and yet at the same time you're interlaced with the stories and you know you're torn because I can't change what happened I can't be happy about it but I am who I am so can we take the history we've learned and then change how we deal with our society and I think that is my role as a native artist or as an artist as a whole is how can I bring attention to things that are wrong and find a way to address it to where we can make a change so the show and I've been working on this show probably doing sketches and research and idea working um, since before my dad passed in 2009 I think at my first write-up of it was like in 2006 because we moved here in 2005 and there was that feeling and it started with that picture I took of my son was one of those feelings of you know the, like when the birds are going and you know really wanting to make these life-size figures and have you have that feeling and so the life-size figures are actually children so they're not really big people <laughs> but then in the space you'll be able to walk in around the feeling and then you'll all those birds so that was one of the reasons we got a bigger space is I just didn't have anywhere to work congruently in wax and you know, and clay mm -hmm. and stuff. So mm -hmm. it will be um, the biggest thing I've done, and I'm pretty excited. And that is set to open May fifth of uh, 2015. So I have just over a year to work on that, and it'll run through all of August or to to the end of August. So oh, I hope it gets to travel. It definitely needs to. Thank you. Um, so what is your creative um, routine? You sort of talk about creative process here throughout, but what's your routine? Do you work in the day? Do you work at night? Do you <laughs> well, it's funny because I used to be the night owl. So when I had the kids and they weren't in school, 
it was mom is mom and it was a human chair and whatever we needed to do and I do little things and they do them with me and I have all these amazing photographs of them in the studio making things with me um, and like my son cast his first bronze at five so and my daughter has some we just haven't cast in wax and um, he used to sit across the table from me and he'd build play-doh figures while I built wax figures so um, that was that and it was real staccato and then I'd get them to bed and then I would stay up until two or three working and then get up the next day and go but now that they're in school my routine is I try and get up at five and do computery junk uh, my husband would go no it's 5 30 I'm like I'm working on five <laughs> uh, and then I get the kids up and get them to school and depending on the weather I either go run I've started running trying to find that healthy place in my life run and walk actually it's uh, wounded gazelle run, walk. <laughs> wounded gazelle run, <laughs> walk. <laughs> and then I come back and um, I work until 2.30 and then I go pick them up and then it's just mom time with them. And then when my husband comes home, it's catch up, how are you doing? And then I shift back out depending on deadlines and I'll do stuff and then I shift back in for dinner and then kids go to bed and depending on deadlines I'll shift back out but the before I was in the house it was easy to kind of step into the room but I felt like I was always being seduced back out and so even though I work time I would do laundry or something stupid and it's so nice being not that laundry is stupid but it's so nice being separate because I I even caught myself going um, when I came home from the studio my husband was like what how long was that commute you know <laughs> oh two minutes across the yard <laughs> but I really felt that division which okay. is awesome so and I don't try and do anything like I don't uh, go shopping or any not like I like stores unless it has hardware but I don't I don't blow the day I use it just for the studio right. and right. the new space is nice because I now have stations so I can start investing or I could run an encaustic, I could do a painting, I can work on this and things can be happening at the same time so as you get congested one place you just pick up somewhere else right. and so your flow continues to roll. So, Well looking back on your career which has many more years to go, what was one fork in the road moment when you might have gone one way but you went another? Um, when we moved from Chicago. Initially the debate, because I hadn't started showing again, and the debate was my husband goes and stays home and I stay, because I was successful. I mean, I was um, a lead designer, an art director at a real estate company, and we did like the Donald Trump Tower and ran photo shoots, and it was like big, fancy meetings and um, good money, and it was either I stay home with the kid, because I was still working full time, but I was doing it from home and I go in one day a week. And I had my son, and it was just like I was working 60 hour weeks and I wasn't sleeping. And mm -hmm. it was like we had to give. And so the discussion was if we moved to Oklahoma, then we could be. I was very pressured to try and get back my family for myself and a connection back to my community, which I'm really glad because I then lost my parents shortly thereafter. But I wanted my kids to know their grandparents and I wanted them to know their cousins and I wanted to not worry about gunfire <laughs> in our neighborhood. And I didn't want to pay $60,000 for them to go to a decent education. And so we were really, you know, and that was the fork that at first we were like, what do we do? Wait a minute. <laughs> and now we're like, it was the right decision because the connection back to my family, back to my roots, and just to focusing on making art. And he is, he's made me promise that I will never work in corporate America again. In fact, I have been banned from any regular job job ever. So that's nice because you don't normally get that, you know, that support. Even because he goes, you're not nice when you're not making art. <laughs> <laughs> what um, has been one of the high points? Ah, oh, the high points. Um, seeing my kids work with me. I mean, that's honestly, I mean, there's winning awards, there's selling art, there's getting a gallery, but I think my favorite, I love this, and this is really my favorite thing. We've had shows. I love them out in the studio, but I love when we go out and we have a show, and they go, that's me! <laughs> and it is, because, like, I will make a piece, but then I, um, I, I'm not um, body like it doesn't have to be exactly right. I had some lady go, well that clavicle's not right. I'm like, she didn't even have freaking ears. Of course the clavicle's not right. But I try and get close. So sometimes I'll have the kids position. I'll go, stand like this. So I have all these crazy photographs of them doing this. And they're like, are you done yet, mom? And then I'll take like a 360 photo of all, because I love the, 
the way they're, my son is thin. My son, thank God, does not have my metabolism. He has my husband's and they're both like this big. And you can see their collarbones and he goes, look what I can do. And he can bend over and show you every vertebrae on his back, you know, and every rib. And the kid eats and eats and eats, but he's just, he's a butterfly, you know, or a hummingbird. I think a hummingbird would be better. And, um, and so it's wonderful to get all those angles. And then my daughter's still thin, but she has a little more curve. And so it's wonderful to photograph the two of them. And, but they come out and they love to sit and make things. And I won't make it for them. So they have a box of wax pieces and they build what they want to build. And then my job, and my son is finally getting to where I'll let him touch the hot iron to things to seal it. But you know, with the wax being so hot, and they love to come out here and make things. And you know, it's, it's a wonderful, experience because I feel like my dad did that with me when I was three. I drew while he drew and it's a connection you just, you know, it's just, it's amazing. And I have photographs of them and my daughter, my favorite image and we were talking about things that we remember and my favorite thing is she didn't talk until she was three. We had to go and start speech therapy and it was interesting because she would take her shirt and put it over her head like it was cuffs. She had this long banshee hair She'd be in her, sh her uh, cowboy boots and a pair of shorts, and she'd get my big sketchbooks, and she'd throw them down, and she'd sit squatting on one side, and then she'd frantically draw on the other. And she is amazingly talented. And it's not, I'm not teaching her anything, it's just being in the environment. If she wants to know something or he wants to know something, I'll explain it, but I've never drawn it for them or erased it. or I want them to create whatever they create, because I feel like, I was always afraid of things and I don't want them to be afraid of. Just go with your gut. See what it, where it takes you. So I think that's the best reward. So, How about one of the low points? Oh. The lowest point, actually, uh, you know, it's not been the work, like making the work. It's been sometimes the reaction to the work, like the sell or no sell. Um, is it funny about the herd in Santa Fe because the response was, I should have sold my booth seven times over. I mean, the response was amazing. People were in awe of the work and not in a like, I'm, yeah, I'm so good, but it, I think my work is so different um, that people have a hard time knowing what to do with it is the best way. And I also wonder sometimes if it is such an honest look that some people don't want to look at the mirror because there it's not always happy fun it's not cupcakes as my husband says he goes you don't make cupcakes you make beef stew and not everybody can handle beef stew you know and um hearty stew with potatoes and stuff and um i last year was really upsetting because i didn't know what was happening for my work and i wasn't going to change it like i mean that's the beauty is we make just enough to not go on vacation, but just enough that I don't have to go get a corporate America job. And I sell enough to cover my cost, but it was really kind of at a, I was shocked. I didn't know what was going on. But the response was, I have people who were just in love with the work, but it wasn't selling, like you would think, for being in love with the work would sell. And luckily, at the end of the year, I realized it is, I'm laying seeds and that's what I'm doing and I'm going to continue to work and the response is what I need but the cell isn't the cell is not what makes it it's I touched all these people's lives and I they understood what I was doing and at first you get so caught up because you're worried well I, I gotta buy more metal I gotta buy more investment how are we gonna do this but it was just that connection but it was my my low point was just not quite getting it you know so makes any sense there <laughs> totally well um we're getting ready to take a look at your work is there anything we've forgotten to cover um i don't think so yeah we're looking at one of your sculptures on a stand here on a base and you want to tell us about her um her name is how about no and <laughs> it's kind of derived from two points one is um watching my daughter and you can kind of see how the hands are on the back and how little kids will kind of put their feet in the ground and stick their chest out and say no. But the other reason is it's built on an idea about me saying no. Because I said yes, yes, yes. And I'll say yes until I'm 
don't sleep at night and behind on my schedule to appease other people. And my husband was, how about you start saying no? And so this is kind of that marriage between, and also a great example of that, that working between seeing myself and my children and then trying to change some of the habits I have and showing them how to change their habits. Right. So, and she is bronze. And my construction is really simple. I try and find the easiest way to put things together. And the whole thing is bronze. And this is textured from a wood and then built. So it's actually all created. And this is the silly part, but is the happiest part. They all have ruffled panties. Oh. <laughs> my great-grandmother used to go to town, and she'd always go, oh, wait, I have to go get my good Pelicis and Pelicis' underwear, and I think Cherokee. Yes. <laughs> and so I always think of her when I make sure everybody has their good town underwear on, their Pelicis. <laughs> so funny. Would you like to tell us about these pieces? This is um, a series of figures that are what I refer to as my cigar figures. And if you look at them, this body is made from a cigar. I make a mold of them and then I pour wax. And then the legs are actual sticks. This shows you the face where it has the detail and the side is a silhouette. And it comes from the story. And here's one where you see the tiny little delicate feet. And then they go into a base. As if Here, let me show me the feet again because I... There we go. You can kind of see how they, they all have toenails and knuckles and oh my ankle bones. But it's the idea of how far a person has walked, you know, the distance that they've carried. And, mm -hmm. and all of the sticks are made from real sticks that are cast. Um, mm -hmm. And that is part of the cigar, which goes into the bloodline piece that I had spoken about previously. Right. Wonderful. Okay, and how about this piece? This is Threshold. And she is um, from the series about the falling figures. And the difference is this one actually has a dress. Most of the falling figures are, um, they're not so that they're androgynous, but they have no clothing on. Um, but this one, I wanted that feeling of that female form and the dress. And it's that idea where you have to release to go to the next level. Mm -hmm. And it sometimes is scary. And so threshold is that, um, like if I love to look words up and find their meanings and all the different things that they represent and threshold is described as the place between two places so it's not anything specific and so with her um, she you see where she has let go of the wall and her face isn't scared it's more accepting of this is what I've decided to do and in my life I feel like I've had many times where I've had to let go the reins of control and fall into what it is and it's a controlled fall in that you know you're choosing it, but it's still a very scary moment when you know that you can't control how you might land. So mm -hmm. that's what they represent. And do you mind showing us, you know, how it hangs? Because yes, and this is this, this was my big epiphany moment. Yeah. <laughs> so it, any wall, sheetrock or wood, it's just a part of the pen, and of right. course she has a nice pellet cheese too. Um, <laughs> and then the pen goes in, and it works on the pivot of the weight. The weight of the body, which is about two pounds, actually holds it in place in the wall. Mm -hmm. So it's completely freestanding. And then right. what I love is when you get the shadows on it, you get the negative space around her, so it has that, but then you get the shadows around it. They're um, a big part of the yeah. total look. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Thank Holly. you. I'm honored that you chose and came out.